But now on to the fun stuff, on to tonight's event. Uh, our chair for this evening is Dr. Alex Kirsting. Alex completed her doctorate in materials chemistry at the University of Birmingham in 2011. Uh, she later joined the Royal Society of Chemistry on the graduate training scheme, and she's been with us ever since. For the last two and a half years, Alex has been working in the education team, uh, project managing technological updates for several websites, as well as the development of new teaching resources, including challenging plants, challenging medicines, and gridlock puzzles. Her latest resource developments have led her into the world of chemistry and art. And she's actually the one that's responsible for leading the RSE's campaign this year of, of chemistry and art. Now, for this, 12 departments at the Royal Society of Chemistry have been working together to offer a range of activities and publications on the subject of chemistry and art. This includes a Chemistry World Special, which is out now, an exhibition, which you may have found some postcards on your seat uh, referencing this evening, uh, educational resources, and of course, a selection of our public lectures, including tonight's talk. Alex has also been working closely with numerous galleries and museums to help showcase the chemistry that goes on behind their art. In particular, she's been working with the National Gallery, from which David Peggy is here tonight to talk to you about some scientific work that goes on behind the scenes there. Now, with that in mind, we are delighted that she has agreed to chair our lecture this evening, uh, so please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Alex Kirsting. Uh, thank you very much, Carrie. Um, so, as Carrie said, uh, tonight's lecture is part of our chemistry and art ongoing theme. Uh, in fact, the theme uh, and all the work that uh, we've all been doing at the Royal Society of Chemistry over the past uh, 18 months or so uh, has originally stemmed from a collaboration with the National Gallery, which was, uh, in fact, developing the original chemistry and art pack. Uh, this is still available to buy, in fact, um, but we've decided to bring it into the 21st century, uh, and so we will be um, updating the uh, images and the stories behind them, and we'll be publishing those on our website, which launches next Thursday, very excitingly, uh, and so we'll have not only uh, content written helpfully by David uh, and updates to the pack, but um, resources looking through the history of chemistry and art. Uh, also, for those of you that are Chemistry World readers, uh, as Carrie said, this uh, month's theme is Chemistry and Art, and David and his fellow colleagues uh, in the scientific department are featured in the career section at the back, um, so do uh, read further on that if that interests you. Um, and then there is a roundup in the latest uh, RSC News that tells you uh, far more about, about what's going on for this year. Uh, in addition, you might have seen our poster outside uh, and also the postcards on your chair for our chemistry and art exhibition. So this will be running from the 14th to the 25th of uh, July, Monday to Friday from 10 till 4. And obviously we'd love it if you could come and see it. It will be featuring both artists' and chemists' interpretations of where the links between chemistry and art are. So this includes uh, insight radical pieces, so these were developed by artists who were in residence in a free radical lab in Australia. Uh, we have some of our Bill Bryson chemistry and art shortlisted entries. We have some of Bristol Chem Lab's uh, work. So this, uh, these are academic images that are then uh, sent to primary schools and creative writing, poems, stories are then written on how the children interpret uh, what are you know, very close up microscopic uh, images and also some of our award-winning Chemistry World Through the Lens images. So uh, I'll be around uh, after the lecture, so if anybody's interested and would like to talk to me further about that, then obviously I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, but anyway, on with tonight's lecture. So David's expertise is in the technological examination of European old master paintings, with particular emphasis on the analysis of organic materials with over eight years' experience at the National Gallery, he works closely with conservators and curators, applying a variety of chromatographic and spectroscopic techniques to the, to the characterization of materials in support of conservation treatments and for the understanding of painting technique. His main research interests uh, include the analysis of natural products, such as oils, varnishes, and dye stuffs, and the investigation of their deterioration products. 
This is mainly achieved using gas chromatography mass spectrometry, high performance liquid chromatography, and both transmission and attenuated total reflectance Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. I think he needs a dictionary just to get to work in the morning. <laughs> Uh, David is a committee member of the User Group for Mass Spectrometry and Chromatography and an associate member of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Before joining the National Gallery, he completed his PhD at the University of Edinburgh Chemistry Department on the identification of dyes on historical textiles, and this was carried out in collaboration with the National Museum of Scotland. So it now gives me great pleasure to invite David to give his lecture, Beneath the Painting, Examining Paintings at the National Gallery. Okay, <clears throat> thanks Alex for that uh, introduction. Um, I promise not to be too technical. We have, uh, I guess, a wide, wide variety of uh, people uh, with different backgrounds here tonight. Um, and hopefully uh, it will be interesting to all of you, uh, this lecture. So I'm an analytical chemist and th the first question really is what on earth is an analytical chemist doing at the National Gallery? So just in case uh, you're not familiar with some of our, our major works, I thought I'd start with the gallery, the gallery collection. So uh, many of you will recognize this, a detail from Van Gogh's uh, sunflowers. So we have beautiful paintings of beautiful things. We've got beautiful paintings of beautiful places. There's a Lake Kital um, by the Finnish artist Gal Galine Kalenina. Uh, beautiful paintings of beautiful animals, uh, Stubbs' uh, whistle jacket. I'll come back to Stubbs later on. We've also got some pretty gruesome pictures. Um, so we've got the, the Rosso on the right, and uh, the painting on the left is an unknown artist, and it's the painting's actually in our uh, what's called historic deposit collection. And uh, if we move on from that, uh, let's, go, let's go the other direction. We've got some angelic, uh, angelic portraits. Um, and this is my favorite detail at the National Gallery. This is uh, a Ferrarese artist uh, called Garofala, and this is uh, um, Christ the Father in Saturday Night Fever, I think, um, <laughs> resplendent with the uh, angels with the with hair. Um, <coughs> so if I was an art historian, I would be, uh, and giving this lecture, I'd be uh, wanting to tell you about the, the different artists that painted these images, uh, the historical context, that these images came from, uh, perhaps a little bit about the, the social and political climate at the time. Um, but I'm not, I'm not an art historian, I'm a chemist, and what I'm interested in is the materials. I'm interested in what they were painted with, how they were painted, and how they've aged, how, how they've changed over, over the last two, three, four, five, six hundred years. So um, the input of scientists at the National Gallery um, has, has a very long history. It um, goes right the way back to Michael Faraday in the 1850s, uh, which is actually not long after the National Gallery was established. Um, and his opinion was sought on a variety of topics, one of which was uh, the site, the location of the, the newly formed collection, and whether a central site, in the, in a site centrally in the National Gallery in, in the centre of London, uh, was a good thing because of, of course, the, uh, the air. You might not think the air is that great now, but in 1850, uh, it was even worse, sooty, smoggy, um, and that had a detrimental effect on, on the paintings. Um, and there's various stories about Faraday and his relationship with the gallery. Um, if anybody's interested particularly in Faraday, I can chat up to them later on about that. Um, but it wasn't until about 1934 four um, that the first scientific advisor was appointed and that's Ian Rollins who you can see there and um, he primarily was interested in imaging uh, in, in imaging techniques for the gallery for photography x radiography and and developing that kind of technical side uh, tucked behind him there I've got a little pamphlet which I can just read on my screen it says the wartime storage of in Wales of port of pictures from the National Gallery and um, some of you may know that the, the collection was, was taken out to, to Wales to, to keep it uh, safe from bombing during the Second World War. And that was one of the first times where a stable environment was, the, the paintings, the collection was kept in a stable environmental conditions and they were observed and uh, 
changes or, or the, 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 the positive effect of keeping them in a stable environment was, was noted and, and, and checked. Um, and we, that's still part of our job today. Uh, I've got an image there from the 1970s and my colleagues um, in, in, um, in 1947 um, uh, a chemical laboratory was established. So we had the Ian Rollins as the scientific advisor, and then uh, in 47, the establishment of a chemical laboratory for the study of paints, varnishes, and conservation treatments. And um, that's, w that's when the, t the, type, the type of work that I'm uh, involved in really began. For those of you that know the gallery, uh, this lab was in the basement and is where the espresso bar is now. Uh, uh, it's, it looks a bit different from my lab now. Uh, my lab's full of um, scientific equipment that is uh, attached to computers, no computers, uh, all wet chemistry. Um, just as a, a sort of little gem of a historical footnote, um, when I first arrived at the gallery, I was going through uh, some boxes of papers, and uh, I came across this letter from uh, E.J. Corey, to Dr. Mills, who's the, then the head of department. Um, and some of you may be aware that E.J. Corey won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1990 for uh, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And so this is sometime before that, but he was asking M Dr. Mills for, for some of this molecule here. Um, and this molecule is found or related to molecules found in Damar, which is a, a painting's varnish. And at that time, uh, chemists at the National Gallery and in academic labs throughout the world were separating uh, natural products, um, uh, or separating molecules from natural products, um, finding out what they were, and in a way leading to um, all the uh, sort of biomedical advances that we now almost take for granted. And um, the National Gallery Laboratory was doing similar type of work, work looking at similar types of molecules. And um, steroid molecules like this are uh, led directly to the development of the pill and um, all sorts of other medicines. Um, so I thought, excellent, I'll be able to tell my assembled audience at the Royal Society of Chemistry that um, the National Gallery Scientific Department played a very small part in, in getting E.J. Corey's Nobel Prize. Um, and then I read a bit further and found the reply um, from John Mills, which basically said, uh, yeah, we would have given you some, but we gave it all to the Japanese. So sadly, um, I can't say that we helped uh, win a Nobel Prize, uh, but never mind, um, the thought was there. Um, so uh, I think after a, that very brief history of the scientific department, um, let's think about the materials. Let's think about the materials that are made, that, that, that these paintings are made from. And um, I'll just... I want to keep my notes up to it just in case I forget anything. Um, so, um, oh, the other thing I was going to say is, yeah, I did forget something um, about that previous slide. Was uh, that was the sort of the theme there was the chemistry laboratory then. I don't have uh, a slide that says the chemistry laboratory now because really that is the rest of my talk. Um, I'm hopefully going to to show you um, and demonstrate what we do now. Um, so, if we want to understand the materials of Te and techniques of Western European art. Let's start with the pigments. And here we can see a collection of pigments that uh, were available um, around 1600. And before I start weaving a little story in here, um, just remember you could weave an infinite number of stories about these pigments. They've all got excellent, they've all had thousands of years of history, or not all of them, but many of them. And um, my story is just one story. Um, and there's lots that I have to leave out. Um, and you might not agree the, the things that I put in were that interesting, but hopefully you will. Um, so let's take this collection of, of pigments uh, based on lead. So lead white is in pretty much every painting in the National Gallery. It was the only white pigment really available right up into the development of zinc white and titanium, and then laterally titanium white. Um, and it has been used for thousands of years. The fact that lead white is in every painting is very, very useful when we come to do things like x-radiography, and you'll see that later. Red lead is another pigment which has been around for uh, a very long time. But curiously, lead tin yellow um, has come in and out of use um, at different times, 
um, and their very existence uh, as a pigment in artworks was lost until their, uh, the, the knowledge that they were used was uh, lost until the re their rediscovery in the 20th century. Now, it's a fascinating story. I'm not going to say, not going to tell it here, um, and um, I'm not going to go into the, the, the subtle difference between type one and type two, um, and just really say that they are related to the glass and ceramics industry, um, which will be important in a couple of slides' time. So then, if we move to the um, the, the earth, so-called earth pigments, the uh, iron oxide pigments, and these are derived from deposits of iron oxide. And yellow and red ochre have been used in pigments um, as in some of the oldest paintings that we know of. And I've put um, the umbers here as well, at the bottom, um, which are essentially uh, iron oxide pigments with um, manganese, um, uh, manganese compounds in there as well, uh, in addition to the iron oxides. And I've also quite sneakily put in green earth um, as an outlier here, which isn't really the same thing. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of clay, um, but I've included it because um, it's it has a lot of associated minerals that are iron oxides, and it's, uh, the colour can be due to the difference between uh, the, the, the ferric and ferrous ratio. Okay, so there's the earths, a little bit boring colour maybe. Um, so let's move to this, this collection of, of pigments. Um, and um, what unites the, this lot? Um, well, you obtain from minerals. So uh, we dig the mineral up and we have to prepare, we have to grind the mineral up and um, uh, prepare these, these pigments. You've got the copper-based malachite and azurite, we've got ultramarine, mercuric sulfide, vermilion, and the uh, highly toxic, toxic um, uh, realgar and orpiment, the arsenic sulfides. So I put this slide in as a, as a little bit of a cautionary tale because it might surprise you to learn that the blue, the two different blues that you can see here, are actually both azurite. And the difference is in uh, the main difference. There's, there's lots of different ways that you can get different colors from pigments, some of which we'll touch on. Um, but the main difference in this case is the, f the coarseness and the fineness of the grinding. So the intense blue in th the main uh, area is coarsely ground azurite, and the lighter, sort of greenish blue, is a very finely ground azurite. So the, the different, um, different, the different grades, the, the, the pigment was available in different grades. So I'm showing you these nice little uh, piles of powdered pigment and saying that's azurite, that's ultramarine. Um, remember you've got a screen in the way that's projected so the color is a bit different. And also um, chemists and alchemists, uh, um, colormen could get lots of different, different colors out of these things. Okay, there's my cautionary tale over. Um, let's move to these, uh, the lake pigments. Now these are my favorite pigments, and you can, you'll be able to tell that because they keep popping up throughout the rest of the lecture. Um, and they're also based on organic materials. Um, so these pigments are derived from dye stuffs obtained from the plants, plants or animals, and the dye has been precipitated or laked um, onto an inorganic substrate to make them into pigments. So your dye is soluble, your pigment is insoluble. And uh, the scale insects are parasites that live on a different host plants. So the kermes lives on the kermes oak. Um, the cochineal, uh, the cochineal uh, insects live on cacti. And um, if we take the uh, dyer's kermes, um, the whole body of the adult female full of unlaid eggs is used and you collect about five grams, uh, five kilograms of insects gives about 50 grams of colorant. Um, and in a good year, one person using their fingernails um, could probably get about a kilogram a day, um, collect about a kilogram a day. Um, it's actually never been possible to farm kermes in the same way. Oh, I've forgotten the lacs. So, and lac, the, the scale insect lac, um, they encase themselves in, in tw in, in, and the twigs that they're attached to in resin. And um, uh, the resin is what's what you know as shellac. And uh, that's still, still available. It's not profitable to farm lac for, um, for dye stuffs, but it is still farmed for shellac. 
um, and cochineal um, is still farmed for its dye. So if you buy E120 food colouring, it's uh, that's carmine, which is cochineal. It's come from cochineal, farmed in Peru, I think. Um, it's still much more profitable to do that. About 20, uh, the, dyed, the dried body of the insect, um, you will about 20% of that is carmine, it was carminic acid. Um, so you've got these, uh, these organic-based pigments, um, and I've also added yellow here, and I added that because, uh, as Alex said, my PhD was on uh, looking at textiles and textile dyes, historic dyes, and I looked at weld um, and various other natural sources, and uh, that's kind of what led me into this, into this job. So we've then got what I've termed the sort of miscellaneous others, uh, Verde degree, many people are familiar with because of uh, the copper. It's a copper corrosion product. The Statue of Liberty looks like it does because it's copper and it's bronze and it's got verde degree all over it. Um, smalt is a ground glass pigment, uh, and indigo uh, is obtained from the plant wood um, and, and from other sources. So that's a very quick run through of pigments that are available about 1600. Um, and then nothing much happens in terms of pigment development for about 200 years. Um, and so Prussian blue was discovered by accident, um, an al alchemist and colour maker. Uh, Naples yellow, I remember I talked about the lead tin yellow uh, pigments. Uh, Naples, yellow, so uh, Naples yellow is lead antimonate, and um, it's also connected with the glass and ceramics industry. And its history kind of mirrors that of lead tin yellow in reverse. So as lead tin yellow um, ca comes out of fashion or is, is, is somehow not used in these industries, Naples yellow seems to come in. And uh, the history of the use of Naples yellow isn't, isn't completely known. Um, and, and then um, Sheila's Green uh, was developed by uh, Carl Sheila, a Swedish chemist, and is a copper arsenate. Uh, and uh, the arsenic means that it's extremely toxic. So the chemists, what have the chemists been doing? Right, we're not very good. We've got um, 200 years and three pigments. Um, but then the 19th century comes along and chemists redeem themselves, okay? So uh, we get a pl pl plethora of uh, a rainbow of paint of colorants. Emerald green uh, is copper aceto arsenite and was um, developed as they tried to improve Sheila's green. Then chemists started to look at uh, synthesizing uh, as sort of modern chemistry, the framework of modern chemistry began to develop. Chemists started to look at um, synthesizing the natural colorants. The, um, and after a competition with the, Fren the French government, um, ultramarine was finally synthesized. Uh, the lake pigments that I talked about, uh, the, col the main coloring component from madder root, uh, which is alizarin, was synthesized, and then um, you could get different colors of these artificial lakes, alizarin, crimson, rose madder. And then uh, Vauquelin discovers um, chromium, the element chromium, and he uh, b begins to develop uh, different colors, chrome, chrome, chromium oxides, green chromium oxides, then chrome, chrome yellows. Um, after cobalt is uh, uh, discovered, uh, subsequent re research by Thenar um, re results in um, cobalt blue, cobalt violet a bit later, and then cerulean blue, which is um, a cobalt stannate, um, was actually discovered in the early 1800s and then wasn't marketed until about 1860. And then finally on this slide, we've got the cadmiums, and uh, Stromier discovers cadmium um, in playing around with it, he makes this ye yellow cadmium sulfide and recommends it himself as, a, as an artist pigment. So, um, let's just get it over here. Uh, so the main, I guess the main take home message is that uh, the source of pigments um, for most of the period that the gallery collection encompasses, which is about 12, 1250 to about 1900, um, the pigments that are on the paintings come from a whole um, variety of, of sources. And um, 
if you're interested in that story, and I, deli I sort of deliberately didn't put a lot of paintings in there um, because there is a, an exhibition at the moment called Making Colour at the National Gallery. It's on until the 7th of September, and it details some of these stories about the pigments. Um, I'd, I'd definitely encourage you, if you're interested in, in the pigments to, uh, side of things, to go and see that. Um, I have a, a, a bit of a secret, though, in the sense that I'm not that interested in pigments because um, I'm an organic chemist and most of the pigments are inorganic uh, materials. Um, and I'm interested in the bit that nobody else is interested in, I think, sometimes. Um, the binder, I'm interested in the organic bits. And um, as somebody pointed out the other day when I told them that, they said, well, you mean you're interested in paint drying? I said, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I guess I am then, <laughs> okay? So... So the next bit of the lecture is about the other bit of paint. So if we think of paint, paint has essentially two components. It's the pigment and the binder um, to make your paint. So let's think about the binder. You'll see me getting much more animated now. That's it. I don't need my notes. Right? Um, so if we start to compare um, two paintings in the National Gallery, um, this one on the left by an Italian painter called Gerini, um, done in the 14th century, and a Rembrandt uh, St. Paul. Um, the way I normally introduce this when I do this slide is say uh, um, binding, binding media. Um, it's really difficult to explain to people and to, to, to make fun, uh, like not like these colourful pigments. Um, but rather than God to help me, I've got St. Paul. Right? <laughs> so, so here's St. Paul helping me. And uh, they look different. Okay? The, the, they look different. Different materials allow the use of different materials allows artists to express themselves differently. Okay? So the painting on the left looks very flat. Um, it's the, the technique is different, it's short strokes. Um, the the, the colouring is different. There's green behind the, uh, the behind the flesh tones. Um, there's gold in there. Uh, here, there's definitely no gold in the Rembrandt. Um, they're actually painted on different supports. Gerini's painted on a, a wooden panel. Rembrandt's painted on a canvas. And all these things together uh, make them look different. And the binder on the left-hand painting on the Gerini is egg. Okay? So you literally crack an egg, uh, get the yolk and beat it up, and you mix your pigments into that. And when we talk about paint drying when it's an egg binder, we're talking about drying in the conventional sense. We're talking about water evaporating and the, the protein that's in the egg denaturing, sort of um, encompassing the pigment particles and drying and, and creating your picture. Egg is still used, strangely, sometimes. Um, this painting is by Michael Gaskell and uh, it was, it's, it's in the portrait gallery uh, just along the road and it was painted in 2011. And uh, I was so intrigued by this picture when I saw it hanging there that I thought, I, want, I wonder if it is actually painted in egg because you, get, um, you now get tube paints, which uh, are they, they're, they're called egg tempera, but they're, they're not egg and they're called egg tempera because they, they mimic the working properties of paint that was egg, that really is egg. So I thought, I wonder if he did use egg. And um, I used a very modern technique to find out. Um, I emailed him, right? Because <laughs> he's, he's still alive, so, <laughs> so unlike most of, the, most of the paintings that I look at, the artist isn't alive. So I emailed him, and I got a fantastic response from him. Um, I got a very long email, and um, he did use egg tempera. He, he prepared his pigments in a very old-fashioned manner. Um, and you can see that um, it's a the working properties of this paint uh, make the style of, sort of hyper-realist style um, uh, um, really co sort of come alive in a strange way. Um, and uh, keep that in your head, the fact that that's ultra-realist, because I'm going to... I'll, I'll, I'll contrast it with something later. But um, uh, So, yeah, he, he used egg temper. It's still, still in use. Um, so, let's go to oil. This is Rembrandt. Um, so, he, he didn't use egg. He used he used oil as a binder, so-called drying oils. And um, in some ways, that's a stupid name for them because they don't dry, not in the same way as, as egg. So when egg dries, as I said, the water evaporates. There isn't any water in the oil. It doesn't evaporate. It does some chemistry. <laughs> okay? It polymerizes. We get lots and lots of... Uh, we get a 3D structure, um, and it, all it's 
full of double bonds. The oil, th what makes an, an oil a drying oil is, is not the fact that it's got water in it or something that evaporates. It's the fact that it's got double bonds in it. And these pop open, they react with the air, they react with one another and form this 3D network. And um, I, um, artists still use linseed oil and uh, the use of oil allows, um, uh, allows for different effects um, and you can impasto your paint, you can get a really thick paint, which Rembrandt's obviously known for, um, and you can work it on the palette, you can work it on the, on the on your painting, egg tempera, you've, you can't really work the pigments into one another. You have to, you have to um, short strokes and next to one another and gradually mesh the strokes together. Whereas oil, you can really get in there and mix them about. Um, I wanted to put a modern example of oil as well in, and I found this one, um, which is not in actually an oil, it's in acrylic, which uh, none of the paintings in the National Gallery are in acrylic. Uh, the retouchings might be but the uh, acrylic is the first sort of synthetic binder, synthetic paint binder, and came in about the 1950s. Um, but I really, really wanted to make this comparison because um, the painting on the right is the sort of antithesis of the painting on the left. You've got, it's not supposed to be realist, you've got the use of paint as a, as a substance, you've got it um, on, this, on the surface there. And it's another scientist as well. It's, uh, it's Higgs, Peter Higgs, who's obviously been in the news with the, the Higgs boson, the discovery of the Higgs boson. And when this paint picture was painted um, in 1981, the Higgs the particle was obviously hadn't been discovered yet. But as an allusion to this theory, uh, Lucinda Mackay, who painted it, um, mixed into her paint sand and the sand you can't really see it but there's it's a little bit grainy if you ever go to edinburgh and have a look at this painting there's sand mixed into this paint and the idea behind that was as the this mysterious particle the higgs particle surrounding us so i just really like that so we've gone from saint paul to two scientists right <laughs> um okay so um for those of you that maybe aren't chemists i wanted to put this slide up i don't have many molecules in this talk but this is my oil this is my triglyceride oil molecule and you can see there's double bonds here um, and you can sort of see it's got lots of dangly uh, dangly bits and um, as these pop open if you imagine another dangly bit next to it and um, a colleague I was with the other day said it's like them linking hands and they're all the linking hands and making this 3d network um, so We've now done pigments and the binder. So now we want to think about how we investigate them. Um, and uh, it would be great if I could tell you that we don't, uh, we don't ever have to take a sample and we can do it all with uh, non-invasive methods, but we do take samples. We take very, very, very small samples though. And um, when we take a sample, because I'm an organic chemist, the other thing that I want to do was put in a GCMS um, at, at, mass uh, at mass spectrum. It's a very busy slide, this. Um, all I want really to, to um, the message of this slide really is just that um, if I take a sample and run it in my GCMS, I can tell things, because of the different peaks that are available there, I can tell different things about the material I'm running. So because this peak exists, because this azelaic peak is there, that means I've got oil. This painting is now. So I've, I've taken a sample from uh, the elbow of the Christ child there. Um, I've run it in my GCMS, up, I've, I've derivatized it, I've run it in my GCMS, and this is what I get. So when I tell people I work at the National Gallery, they think I will look at paintings all day. I do look at paintings a lot, but I actually look mostly at things like this. And um, because that peaks there, I know I've, I'm dealing with an oil paint. And then the, parameter, the, the, ratio, the ratio between these two um, peaks here, um, on my long dangly molecule, I said the double bonds are important. When there's no double bonds, when it's saturated, um, they shouldn't change. So over th hundreds of years, I should have the same proportion of palmitate and stearate as I did right at the beginning. And so I look at that ratio, and that tells me something about what type of oil is there. So in this case, I know that I'm dealing with linseed oil. There's another type of sample that we take, um, which is uh, what you call a cross-section sample. And that's where I'm not so, uh, so the, the GCMS sample, I have to, I scrape it, I make, I get a powder and I manipulate that powder and I put it in my instrument and it disappears, that's it, it's gone. 
cross-section is a little bit different. I'm not so much interested in one layer. I'm interested in all the layers of that painting. Um, and I'm interested in, in the, the layering of the paint. So we've taken a sort of geological core type sample. Uh, we've then encased it in resin, uh, and which hardens. Um, and you can see the resin blocks down here. And my samples, which are this little bit in here. So that's about ha less than half a millimeter in, in length. So my samples are very, very small. These are then ground edge on so that you can get something like this. Um, so you can see the yellow that was here in my unmounted fragment and then a blue on the top. And that's beginning to tell me something about the artist technique. And I can then put that resin block into a scanning electron microscope. I mean, the sample is so small. To get this picture, we have to look at it under a microscope. So um, we then look at it under a microscope and think about what that means um, in terms of painting technique. So I thought it would be instructive to have a sort of theoretical cross-section up here. So we've got support, we've said a panel or a canvas, sometimes both of them, a ground layer to prepare the paint, uh, to prepare the support for painting. Um, in older paintings, that can often be chalk mixed with glue. In more modern paintings, we have what's called an imprimatura, which is, is really just to sort of um, just let the, the support soak up the uh, binder first and then you can paint on it so you get paint layers then varnish layers and something that I didn't put on here you will often have retouching uh, small amounts of retouching and then a varnish layer on top of that um, and here's an, I just like this cross section because I like the painting um, Renoir's boating on the Seine and you can see we don't have all of these here we, we, do, we don't want the support and the can we don't want a hole in the object we just want you know we just want the paint layers um, and you don't always get the ground layer or the imprimatura so you know you have to use some uh, some knowledge of painting technique to interpret these cross sections so I've got my sample what kind of questions are we trying to trying to answer well this is a particular interest of mine um, because I'm an orga organic analyst, um, I'm interested in this transition of the use of bi uh, one type of binder to another. So from in Italy in the 15th century, they effectively moved from egg tempera to the use of oil as the binder on these pigments. So remember, these pigments didn't change in that period up until about 1600. They all had the same paint the pigments, but the binder changed. Now, if you walk around the National Gallery, you'll see that <coughs> um, paintings painted in Italy in the 1300s look completely different from paintings painted in Italy in the 1500s. And one of the reasons, just one of the reasons for that, is the different use of, of the binder and the use of oil. Um, one of the reasons for uh, th that that transition could have happened um, is uh, the, optical, the different optical properties the binder had. So I, the, the previous uh, slide where I uh, um, compared um, the hyperrealist, uh, or let's do Giorini with Rembrandt, um, and, we talk, and, and then the hyperrealist one with the, uh, Peter Higgs. Um, I was sort of talking about the physicality of the paint and the impasto and how you could you could really sort of slosh that paint on. This is something slightly different. This is the, the sort of optical properties of paint. So um, this example is painted in egg tempera, and the uh, if you're trying to get the shadows of, of a drapery, um, the refractive index of oil uh, of egg of water or egg and the pigment um, are quite different. And when you move to an oil binder, that difference in refractive index uh, becomes less, and it means you some certain pigments become more transparent. Uh, you can layer them, and because of the working properties of oil, you can really um, you can start to manipulate it. And the color, the tone, the, the tonal balance of your painting can change. And you can get a really some really naturalistic effects. And the reason um, I had a nice little pithy statement about the reason why it changed, and I've lost my place. Um, so <coughs> um, the reasons for this change uh, between from egg to oil. Um, are particularly complex, uh, but from a materials perspective, um, it's the, the sort of use of the, the, the creating this more natural, sorry, creating this more um, naturalist finish is is one reason, and um, the reason that I wanted you to keep the um, hyperrealist and uh, Higgs painting in your head was because this is the complete opposite. So hyperrealist painting used egg tempera. 
And here I'm telling you that if you use egg tempera, it doesn't look naturalistic, but if you use oil, it does. And of course, the acrylic painting didn't look realistic at all. Um, and uh, it's worth just, just mulling that over in your head as, as the lecture progresses, because the more you think about it, the more interesting it is. Well, it is for me, but I like paint drying. So, um, okay, so um, the, the, the use of oil um, and exactly why and how this change um, happened uh, came about has been discussed and debated for lit quite literally centuries. And um, using oil as a binder, um, um, well, so it's been discussed for centuries. And um, what is true is that Northern European painters uh, were painting in, in oil hundreds of years before, um, before this change. Okay, so oil, is, it wasn't that oil was discovered, which is um, what Vasari, in writing in the 16th, uh, mid 16th century, um, he writes that Van Eyck discovered oil painting. And that myth perpetrated f for centuries, um, and we do know that that's wrong, okay? Van Eyck didn't invent oil paint. Um, but the, answer, the question still is a, an interesting question. What happened? Um, how, why was this change culturally? Why was this change? I mean, partly it's to do with the um, looking outwards, thinking about the, I mean, the, the Renaissance and a sort of general s s um, idea of uh, looking outwards, being more concerned with this world than the other world. Um, but um, when thinking about the question, um, especially within Italy, it's, it's, um, and thinking about how you gather evidence to support any particular theory that you might have, um, it's worth sort of considering that Italy wasn't a uh, one nation at that point. Um, around the middle of the 15th century, Italy was a patchwork of city-states and republics. And I've just got a few slides here, w which in modern parlance, these are probably your early adopters, just like you get early adopters of technology. Um, and so some early adopters of oil in Florence um, here, in Ferrara, um, and in Venice. Um, but as a scientist, I want evidence. I want to know, you know how, how can we chart that movement? How can we chart the movement of ideas, the movement of, of technique um, around Italy? I need to look for evidence on these paintings. And you'd think that would be straightforward, um, especially with all this fancy, tech, fancy equipment. The question, so the question that I'm asking is, um, uh, to a chemist like myself, is can I tell the difference between egg so protein or oil. Uh, to any chemist worth their salt, they should look at you and go, of course I can. It's a very easy thing to do. And then if I say, well, okay, what if my sample is less than half a millimeter in size? And then you go, well, you know, that's, that's small, but it's not as small as you know, these, the, these bits of kit. They're used to dealing with really small samples. And then you say, well, okay, hang on, I've got a small sample and it's 500 years old. And then you go, okay, well, you know, it's getting a bit more tricky. And then you say, well, actually, my sample might not all be oil, and it might not all be egg, because it's got pigment there. Um, and then we don't actually know how that transition happened. Uh, they could have had a nice under layer of paint and egg tempera, and then put some oil paint on top of that. And then the chemist starts to back away from you. And you go, OK, I don't know if that was a good idea to say I could do that. Um, and then you've got 500 years of history. Then you've got, thing, you've got varnish layers on top of it. Um, some varnish, varnish um, recipes had oil in the varnish. Um, so then you're thinking, okay, well, what is my sample? Is my sample real? Is it, is, it, is it the material that was put on this painting 500 years ago? So it's actually a trivial, it, it's a simple question and a non-trivial answer. Um, and I don't have an answer. That's what I'm going to spend the next 30 years thinking about, I think. Um, and it's also complicated by things like this. So this example here, um, this is a cross-section from um, an associate of Leonardo da Vinci. And um, I've got a very clever instrument, which is, uh, I won't repeat, but it's one of the ones that Alex mentioned in our introduction. And I can get a red spectrum from, um, I don't know what I'll do this. I can get an infrared spectrum from just that particle. And if you look at the infrared spectrum, anybody who's ever looked at protein spectra, um, that is amide one and two bands. So 
I've got protein in this. It's definitely an oil paint. I promise you it's an oil painting. But there's protein in there. So does that mean that the painter painted a bit of oil and a bit of with a bit of oil and a bit of protein? Well, this is where you need to know a little bit about the technology of pigment manufacture because that pigment is a red lake pigment. It's, it's one of those uh, that are derived from a beetle, uh, from the scale insects. It's not the scale, as you might imagine, it's not the scale insects protein that I'm seeing because these pigments were really expensive and one of the ways that they got them was, uh, and they were used for dyeing of tapestries and textiles, um, and nothing was wasted. So at the back of a textile, um, you, you have lots of loose, loose ends, loose threads, and they would shear these loose ends off and um, collect together all the, all the sort of shearings, and they'd extract the dye, it was so expensive, they'd extract the dye stuff back off the wool or silk fibers. And um, the, the protein that you're seeing there is actually protein that was originally a wool or a silk fiber that's got into the pigment through this. It's, like an, uh, it's sort of like a recycling, an uh, early, early example of recycling of materials because of their expense. So th the research and documentary sources and materials and techniques and just in general bigger art historical questions are all tied together. And um, um, if we fast forward, so I'm going to park that question. I'm going to park the question about um, Italian painting and the transition of binders. And um, fast forward a couple hundred years to this painting. And uh, this dovetails really nicely with uh, last month's lecture, which if anybody saw that, it was an excellent lecture about Wedgwood. Um, and as, as you'll be aware from that lecture, Wedgwood was a really pioneer, pioneer in both the sciences and the arts. And uh, this is a, a poet, and George Stubbs, who was rather derogatorily known as the horse painter at the time, um, worked with Wedgwood, um, developing various enamelling techniques. And uh, this is a, a sort of self-portrait on, on an enamelled panel. Um, and this exchange of ideas and thinking about materials might be one reason why this painting, which is the first ever depiction of a kangaroo in Western European art, um, and came from Captain Cook's voyage um, in the Endeavour, and Joseph Banks, who was on that voyage, brought it back and uh, commissioned Stubbs to paint it. So he brought the skin back, commissioned Stubbs to paint it, and uh, he literally blew it, blew it up like a balloon, plonked it there and said, right, that's a kangaroo, um, could you paint it for me? And he painted it in a binder of wax. Not oil, not egg, wax. I know that because of this GCMS trace. And um, that itself is very interesting. Of how do you paint with wax? But also why? What on earth was he doing? Well, it's got some analogies with enamelling technique. But it's also um, he was working in a period where uh, people like himself, um, Benjamin West and Joshua Reynolds, whose statue is out here, um, the very first... Um, um, uh, Royal Acad 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 Academician, <laughs> I can never get that word out. Um, so he, uh, they were all asking that same question. What were these old master paintings using? How were they painting? What were they painting with? And if I think I've got a tough job with GCMS, FTIR, all these techniques, imagine how difficult it was to answer that question in the 18th century. If you want to know how something was painted, you pretty much the only thing at your disposal is taking a sample and melting it, heating it, um, or burning it. That's pretty much all you could do, and you don't want to do that really with a with a painting. So um, it's a very tri this this idea of trying to investigate the binders is quite a tricky thing. <coughs> um, and I also wanted to mention that um, if you're interested in this painting and the history of this painting, uh, there is an exhibition that starts on the seventh of August at the National Maritime Museum. Which um, uh, who, uh, who I've been collaborating with on the analysis of, of the kangaroo. Um, before I part binders completely, I also wanted to show this slide where we have got a few paintings in the National Gallery which are bound in glue, very unusual medium in one sense. It's unusual because we don't have very many of them. There would have been thousands and thousands and thousands of paintings done in glue for various reasons, um, but th th very fragile and don't, don't really survive. And I just thought this comparison was nice because these two images, both painted in glue, are separated by about half a millennia. 
about 500 years. Um, there's loads I wanted to say about that, but I'm absolutely going to run out of time, so I'm not going to do that. Um, <coughs> so we've looked at the materials, we've looked at how we investigate the materials. So what? You know, what what's the point of all this? Well, in conservation, when these images, when these paintings are conserved, scientists need to be um, involved in every stage of this process. Um, hopefully it should be obvious from what I've just been um, talking about why it's important um, to know that it's not obvious, it's not a trivial question what's in these, uh, these paintings. Um, so before you clean, before you're going to attempt to clean a painting, you want to know what materials are present, are they original, you want to know the solubility, you want to know what materials should be used during the restoration process, and after restoration, um, you want to think about how that painting, newly restored painting, is cared for, um, its environmental conditions, if it goes out on loan, how it's packed, how you, how you transport it safely. So, so my last group of examples, really, is to just give you a, a few nuggets of, 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 of a few examples of, of the cleaning process. So discoloured varnish is quite an, uh, uh, a sort of usual one. Um, you can think of varnish as often as a, as a sacrificial layer, <coughs> um, and they're often yellow. And uh, I can take a scraping of this varnish, we can tell what's in it, and then um, work with the conservators to who, who, can, who are actually cleaning off. I don't do the cleaning, I'm not, I'm not a restorer. Um, you definitely wouldn't put a brush in my hand. Um, I, I'll do the analysis and um, communicate and, and um, collaborate with the restorers. Um, when I give this talk to school groups, I don't show this picture. Um, this is how it looks when it's cleaned. <laughs> um, and you'll notice that it does look different. Um, I'll just go it back. So um, the, um, it's not just a, a varnish. Um, there is a um, retouching uh, on this, uh, which was probably done <laughs> likely done by Victorians who were much more prudish. Um, so you'll notice she's got big doughy eyes, um, her hair colour's changed, and uh, you probably wouldn't take a shore to your mother. Um, so, <coughs> um, so when in that cleaning process, you don't just take off the varnish, you often take off old retouchings. Um, that cleaning process is entirely dependent on having a difference in, in material aspects of your, your the, the layer you're taking off and the paint layer. So if they are similar, um, it's going to be very difficult to clean this, the picture. Now, I said that Reynolds was a great experimenter. He was interested in how on earth did these old masters um, create these images that he could see um, in 1787. And he mixed all sorts of materials in his paints. And uh, he was actually renowned even within his own lifetime for his paintings disintegrating because he, he, he tried some, uh, some terrible things. <laughs> and um, this cross-section from this painting, um, the, the image below is uh, the same cross-section just illuminated by ultraviolet light. And when it um, fluoresces like this, um, it means there's a lot of organic material in there. And in effect here, what he'd mixed in is lots of mastic resin. And mastic resin is uh, the same resin that's used to varnish the paintings. So if you're trying to take a varnish layer off, um, you're also going to start taking Reynolds paint layers off. And this is a sort of un unmounted fragment to show you that there's uh, a sort of pigment in this kind of very medium rich um, kind of binder. So you know, it's very difficult to clean this, uh, this kind of painting. Um, thankfully, most paintings aren't like that, and uh, this picture, this painting here, Backhausen, is an example of a, a sort of easy clean. Yeah, I can say that because I don't clean them. Um, so uh, it's a very solid paint structure, and did some cleaning tests there, and then halfway through the clean, you can see the line here, and then clean. And you can see that the difference, taking off a really old yellowed varnish, really it, it can. It adds depth back into the painting. As, as paintings darken like that, um, it really flattens them. Um, I'm not going to say anything much about this example. Um, we can often identify overpaint. Uh, this came into the gallery in the 1990s with this, and it looked like that. Um, if you take a cross section from that painting, you find that there's this blue on top. This is actually a varnish layer, and then there's a brown paint below. And when you investigate that further, you find that that brown paint is over all the back and, and is original. Um, when you 
uh, investigate the blue material, you find that it's uh, a, pain, uh, a pigment called Prussian blue, which if you're all paying attention right at the beginning, um, you'll know that that was invented around about 1700. And this painting is German from about the 15th century, so uh, it ain't original. And because the cross-section shows there's a lot of pig, uh, original paint, it was taken off. And if you go to the gallery now, that's what the painting looks like. Um, his hat, the, 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 the old blue background went over the hat, so his hat ended up being extended a little bit. Um, and you can see the shadows still there. Now, if you want to know why that uh, change was probably made, I'm going to direct you to the Royal Society of Chemistry website, where we have a, uh, we're beginning, a, uh, the, the, as part of this collaboration that Alex said, um, there's three videos all about this, uh, about this example. Um, they're uh, split um, to about the different techniques. The story is the same, so the beginning and the end are the same. Um, so if you click on the second one and you get the same beginning, that's all right. The content in the middle is different. Okay. Um, in my very, um, I've pretty much run out of time, but it's okay because I've got just a few examples left, I promise. Um, so I want to just remind you of the electromagnetic spectrum and think about. First of all, what we see, just and you as a, a gallery visitor, and how that might change, uh, or how what, what might have changed. Um, because now that we've learned all about the materials, the, the pigments in the binder, and some of the chemistry that goes on, really we're now in a position to understand these images. And if you pay particular attention to the color of this sheet, that drapery that she's reclining on, you can see that this digital reconstruction, it got a lot more purple. Okay, and that's just a digital reconstruction. Um, the pigment in there, it's a red lake pigment. Remember that red lake pigment that I, I like so much? Um, because it's organic based, it's very prone to fading. The mixture of this, in the, the pigment mixture in this um, drapery is azurite, that mineral pig, blue mineral pigment, and red, red lake, to make this really luscious purple. But the red has faded <coughs> and um, so you don't really get that effect. You get this kind of grayish effect rather than this really luscious purple. And that's much more, it, the color balance is obviously wrong because other, other um, uh, pigments have also changed, but it does help to indicate how, how different the pic picture might have looked. Um, this example, that was the pigment fading. This example is of pigment reacting with the binder, the oil. Um, another digital reconstruction, that's how this sky would have originally looked. So there's a nice comparison between the two. So small, this ground glass, cobalt containing glass pigment, um, that's changed, that's the, 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 it's actually not the cobalt that reacts, it's, um, it's another, it's the, the potassium that's in the glass. Um, that leaches out of the glass, it reacts with the oil binder and it changes the uh, environment of the cobalt which changes the colour. Uh, and I just wanted to show you that the same things happened in this example. It's not so obvious because his blue coat, um, the highlights are all in ultramarine and they haven't changed colour. Um, but this would have all been blue, this underlayer would have all been blue. So this brown mush is actually smalt. And if you don't believe me, um, we've got a scanning electron microscope in the department. And when you look at that cross section under the SEM, you can see it looks like broken glass because that's exactly what it is. It's uh, ground up, broken, broken up glass, but it's now reacted to form this mush. Okay, the most exciting bits, I think. Visible bit of light is only one part of this spectrum, and we're used to thinking about vi the way visible light interacts with m matter. If we use infrared with a longer wavelength, we can, we can ignore the paint. We don't need the paint. And if we look at this Raphael um, and use what's called infrared reflectography, we can start to see the artist's underdrawing. So this is the artist prepared, this is him, his preparatory sketch um, about before he paints. Every time I look at this, it absolutely blows my mind because Raphael would, could not, would not have ever believed that I could ever, anybody would ever be able to see his preparation layers, okay? Looking through the paint, 
and this is him sketching before he starts. And you can sometimes see those changes in the, oh, the structure of the buildings, etc. Not all paintings have underdrawings. Not all paintings with underdrawings can be seen. Um, if you're interested in this, I can chat a little bit. I'm just aware of the time. Um, I can talk a little bit more about how this works uh, when we're having a drink. Um, my final example takes us right back to uh, the establishment of the scientific advisor, Ian Rollins, in 1934. And as I said, he was initially charged with looking at imaging techniques and imaging of the paintings in the National Gallery. And if you image pictures uh, with using x-rays, so in the same manner as you image uh, your arm if you have a broken arm, um, you get images like this. And uh, my first pigment slide had lead white in it. Very useful to have lead, heavy metal, means that when you shine, or when you, you um, have x-rays, um, the lead impinges the x-rays, doesn't have the plate. So it means that you can see where lead white's been used. And you can tell a little bit about the technique of the painter. So he's used all lead white here, areas with no lead white. There's obviously lead white in the highlights mixed in with the ultramarine in the highlights and then the flesh paint in the, in the hands. So that's my standard. This is how x-rays work. This is what you can find out. This is my sort of wow finisher. <laughs> so um, this Goya, if you x-ray this painting by Goya, you get this. And hopefully you can see there's another face peeking out from probably about there. Okay. So um, if I may, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to um, my uh, professor from Edinburgh University who sadly died several years ago. Uh, he was an immensely kind man and I think if he knew that I'd been invited to speak here, he would be uh, very pleased. So, um, so this is for Hamish. Um, and it just remains for me to thank you very much for your attention on this incredibly hot day. Um, and if you're interested in the technical aspects of, of what we do at the National Gallery, we do try and publish in all sorts of different ways. Uh, one of the ways we do it is through our website, and we have what's called a, an annual publication called the Technical Bulletin. Um, and we've now got all the back issues free on the website, and the current issue goes free, I, I can't remember if it's after six months or 12 months. Um, so, so yeah, take a look, and um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. So, thank you very much, David, for that really interesting uh, look into behind the scenes, both at the National Gallery and literally behind the scenes uh, in, in some of the paintings that, that you've showed us. Um, obviously, now the floor is open to questions. Um, ask him while he's here. Uh, Duncan, there's a gentleman just next to you, please. My name is uh, Martin Berry. Um, I'm a retired school teacher, and I've been a member of this uh, society and its precursors for 57 years. But more to the point, I did most of the work on the original 1999 pack, okay. mm -hmm. Chemistry of Art. And it was the Welcome. most fun. <laughs> it was the most fun project I've ever <laughs> been involved with. And uh, I, I've got a pack here. If anybody wants to have a closer look at it, and I must also say that uh, the gentleman with the hat, the portrait of Alexander Mornauer, um, Anthea Pepin, and I, uh, Anthea from the um, National Gallery, and myself, did a paper about that in the. Uh, magazine e education in chemistry right, yeah. and I'd like to say that uh, I, I cooperated with uh, Colin Osborne and John Johnston at this society to produce that pack and it was designed by a genius called Gordon McSweeney and I'm so glad that it was referred to this evening I was going to be rather miffed if it hadn't been <laughs> Oh, well, well, thank you very much for your kind words. I'm very pleased that, you've, uh, that you had a, a whale of a time making it in the first place. And uh, uh, Duncan and I and, and lots of other members of the RSC are now um, really we'll enjoying ourselves. A yes, <laughs> having a great time, uh, re reinvestigating, uh, looking at it again and seeing how much uh, we can broaden the rest of our activities to, to link in with the same theme because it's often um, something that, you know, lots of what David has shared with us tonight... Um, 
I'm sure you'll all appreciate we don't often realise when we go into, into galleries and museums at all that this is the, you know, there's scientists and, and often chemists beavering away upstairs um, helping to look after these things and make them look better often. So, thanks very much. Uh, yes, please. Hi, thank you very much. That was a really, really interesting lecture. Um, I was just wondering how or who makes the decision to, um, if you've got a, an example like you had in your last slide there where you've got a, a hidden drawing underneath yeah. something, um, how do you decide whether you're going to uncover that or how do you decide whether you're going to leave it like um, it has been? So, ultimately, the, the decision is always ultimately uh, the, um, the curators. So the curator, uh, when they are in charge of the, all the decisions around the paintings that they have been given charge of. Um, however, um, the collaboration between the curator, the conservator who will actually be doing the work and the scientist is something that the National Gallery are particularly proud of and it's been quite a long, it's got a long history of uh, communicating and collaborating together um, so that the decision which is ultimately the curator's um, is informed by um, information from ourselves and the restorer. So we have meetings, if there's a painting in the conservation studio and there'll be questions that come from the restorer as they're, as they're restoring it. Um, and they will speak to us about it. We'll decide whether we have to sample. We will try not sample. If there's, no, if there's not a good reason to sample, we won't sample. Um, if there's a particularly good reason, a question, um, we'll, we'll think about taking a sample. Um, but always, ultimately, the decision is the curator's. Um, and often it's... Uh, rather than uncovering a, a drawing or a, a something underneath, it's often about colour balance and about if you clean this area, it's particularly damaged compared to this area. So how, um, and also th these paintings, we think of these paintings as um, museum objects, which they obviously are, but um, we sometimes forget that they've had five or six hundred years of history when they've not been treated in the way that we are treating them, and they've been sawn up. I could show you lots of examples where things have been cut apart, um, stuck back together, all sorts of things have happened to them. And what you're actually doing when you're looking at uh, analysing the material aspects of a painting is almost peeling back those layers of history and thinking, OK, at what point do we stop? Because um, you're actually never, you're never going to get back to how that painting looked like uh, exactly when it was painted. There's too, ma too many, there's too much history. Um, but what's a sensible position, what's a sensible point to go, this is good. Mm. So that's, the, the question is almost at what, what stage do you want to leave it? Oh, do you need the microphone? Once you've taken the old binder off, all the people, oh, so or the, sorry, varnish, the, the varnish, yeah. do it, uh, the varnish off. What do they replace it with? Do you replace it? Try and replace it with light black, or do they use a modern equivalent? Um, that's a very good question. Um, some uh, sort of natural resin varnishes are still in use, but um, there are also modern alternatives: ketone N resin um, and um, uh, cyclohexane. Some based on cyclohexanone, um, and that will offer that, that choice. Will that, that choice is the restorers because they are trying to make the image, the picture, um, look its best. And the, what it's replaced with will often be determined by um, the material aspects of what they've uncovered the painting itself. So if, say, an area of ultramarine is particularly um, damaged um, or um, an area of red lakes or something, the characteristics of when you paint a varnish on that, it might, it might dampen, it, it might be quite light scattering. So they use their expertise to think, okay, if I spray a modern varnish on this, it's going to be too glossy and it's, it's going to sink into this area. So I'm going to have to use a percentage of this with a percentage of that. So um, what, again, all, the, all these questions, they sort of almost start as very simple questions. And as you delve into them, you think, ah, so it's not even just a case of brushing or choosing a varnish and brushing it on. You might have to choose a, um, a mixture, spray it on, see how it looks, um, and then spray another layer of something else on. Um. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes, hand shot up in the middle. It is my, yes, it's on. Given that in your gallery, all the paintings are exposed to light mm -hmm. 
temperature and whatever's in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Have you worked out the ideal conditions to prevent paintings from deteriorating whilst they're on show? Okay, that's a very good question. The, um, the ideal conditions would be not to display them and to sort of yeah. <laughs> uh, um, shoot them into space or something. Um, there is always a balance between access um, and uh, using them for the intended purpose. Uh, that's not slightly true, given that most of them, a lot of them were in churches, and it's obviously not in a church. But um, we want to display them, and um, what we try and do is minimise the the change, any change that might happen. Because they're old, um, almost every degradation curve I've ever seen goes like this, a sort of, um, so it starts off fast at the beginning and then tails off. Um, so because they're old, the nature of the collection means that we're actually at the tail, so almost always at the, the, all the bad stuff has, has already happened, and what we're trying to do is stabilise it in as now. And we can do that by, we filter all the UV light, for instance, so there's no UV component in the gallery. Um, the, uh, any, the natural light that comes through is, is, has, a, has a UV filter on it, and the lights have no, no UV content. Uh, most, not all, but most of the gallery rooms are now air conditioned and filtered, um, so you don't have particulates. Um, Faraday, the, the, something I wanted to say about Faraday, but didn't really have time. Um, he, was a, he, was a, he was asked his opinion as a trustee at one stage um, about whether the National Gallery should be located in the, on Trafalgar Square. And he had two answers for that, uh, which are quite revealing of the man in, in some ways. Um, the answer as a chemist was it shouldn't be the National Gallery shouldn't be at that time in 1850 in the middle of central London because the, 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 the ruinous atmosphere, as he described it, would damage the paintings. But f from a social perspective, they wanted the gallery to be in the centre of London so that the common man, the working man, had a chance to see these, it was very kind of, to elevate themselves to, uh, uh, to see this, these great works of art. And he abstained in his vote because there was a correct scientific answer and there was a social answer that was the opposite. Um, and also, th it was worth noting that they wanted to move, oh, the, the other site was what's now um, V&A, which at that time was regarded as out in the sticks. Um, so actually, it wouldn't have made any, any difference in the long term. Um, but, uh, but no, th we do try and attempt to um, control things. We control the things that we can and have a balance um, for, for access. I wondered um, how much you get to um, experiment on those paintings you have on loan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you tell them? <laughs> um, uh, we don't experiment on uh, loan paintings. Um, the, uh, in fact, we don't experiment on our own paintings. I should, <laughs> I should, I should make this term clear. Um, so we, um, the decision for sampling. Um, although it's our decision, as I said, we, 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 um, uh, we communicate and uh, collaborate with all the, the different stakeholders, to use a nice modern term, um, but l loan paintings we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't sample, um, and we certainly wouldn't do anything without speaking to the, the lender, and the lender, uh, if we had a good reason, if we were really interested for a particular reason, we would probably contact the lender and say, look, we've got this really interesting project, and we think your painting might help would you be willing to um, allow this painting to be sampled? Which occasionally happens, and we have done, but um, we wouldn't do anything in secret. No, <laughs> I did, I did. I <laughs> hoped you wouldn't, yeah. but uh, <laughs> you'd be very hard to publish. Keep it yeah. secret if you then published it. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, there we go, in the back in the middle. Thank you. Um, how do you assess the ageing characteristics of the materials you're using to repair or to replace varnishes and other components? Yeah, painting. that's a very good question. We, so um, I've been to the gallery for about eight years now, and it's not actually something I've particularly done, um, mainly because th there's, so there was a lot of research in the 60s and 70s on, and 80s about these new varnishes that were coming through. Um, in general, what you find is the modern materials, the, the acrylics that they use for uh, retouching, uh, the varnishes, um, 
they're stable enough for the lifetime of that they'll be needed because the, the sort of central tenant of conservation, if you like, is that anything you do is reversible. Now, uh, that isn't always necessarily the case, but something like retouching of a painting, you will almost always retouch on top of a varnish layer so that as you're taking, if a clean, if a restorer in 20, 30, 50, 100, 150 years time is taking that varnish layer off, they'll also take your retouchings off. And in some sense, the, um, the change that's going to happen is going to be one where the color match that was done at that period of time, because of changes in all the materials in that painting over time, the color match will gradually go off. And it might be because of discoloring varnish. It might be because of the aging process of the original components mismatching with the aging of the, uh, the new modern materials. So in a way, the question is, uh, you're, you're wanting to make sure that you don't cause any more damage and, and have a reasonable amount of time before you have to intervene again. So, and the, the materials that are used now, in effect, are okay, and we, I, I haven't done much testing of, of modern materials. The British Museum have a scientific department, and they do a lot more of that, and that's because their collection is so much more varied. So they've got all sorts of objects um, and have to do all sorts of uh, odd things. I hope my British Museum colleagues aren't listening. They, I, I don't mean odd in terms of bad. Um, they, they, they have to come up with a very interesting, they've got a very interesting set of problems that they have to sort. Um, so what you find is they might have to use materials that haven't necessarily been used. Whereas paintings, in some ways, the, the questions are kind of simple. It's a, it's a painting and you've got colour matching and that's it. It was a very long-winded answer to say we don't really do it, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned two words, um, conservation and restoration. Okay. Can you tell me where one stops and the other starts? Ah, that's, a, uh, that's a tricky one. Um, so, in some sense, it's a personal preference. Uh, the modern uh, terminology generally favours conservation because uh, restoration tends to imply that you're restoring something to its former glory. And really, we're not doing that. We're, we're, uh, so the examples that I showed with the smalt and the, uh, the, the Velasquez with, with the purple drapery, we would never even consider painting all that back in. Um, we're, we're showing you what the paintings are like now and stabilising it and stopping any further damage. We're not, because otherwise you'd go around the gallery thinking, oh, well, it's, um, it's Velasquez with uh, the restorer who happened to work on it and last. And we don't want that, really. Um, but, um, yeah, it's... Uh, does that answer it a little bit? <laughs> I had an old lady friend who said she saw the Impressionist paintings in France mm -hmm. when they were impressioning, but now, because the materials they were using, because they were poor and such like, have mm -hmm. uh, really gone downhill. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what you would do to those, but uh, I, I believe with tapestries nowadays, they, and you were doing some too, mm -hmm. of, if you like, just taking the picture and then um, twiddling the knobs yeah. and enhancing, and maybe that's... A new tech, uh, I haven't yeah. checked, but uh, whether that's the new techniques, mm -hmm. so that the before and after, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so you're not really touching it at all, but you're saying this is what it would be like, mm -hmm. uh, or how it was like when they, when they did it, yeah. and you can really tweak it. Yeah. To get up. So I think with modern technology, you've got a lot of options now. So um, there was a project a couple of years ago now with Hampton Court Palace who projected uh, coloured light of uh, onto their tap some of their tapestries to give a sense of what uh, the, 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 the yellows and the greens might have looked like. So they, 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 um, they chose complementary colours to project onto it to, um, to give the same effect. Or you could take the picture and digitally construct it. Um, but yeah, that's, it's definitely um, new technology will allow these comparisons. The first point about Impressionism uh, some of those pigments did degrade, and in fact, Naples yellow, which is that p 
pigment that is connected with the glass and ceramics. And um, you've actually got sort of the easiest way to think about it is lead, tin, yellow at one end of the spectrum, and lead, um, uh, uh, lead chromate at the other, or lead antimony, sorry, at the other. And then you've got lead, tin, yellow. Um, then you've got some antimony, lead, tin, antimony, yellow and then the tin disappears and you've got lead antimony yellow and you can have sort of different percentages all the way along that line. And Naples yellow, which is at this end, depending on the way you manufacture that, uh, sorry, um, chrome, chrome yellow, uh, which is one of these modern pigments, because of the way you man manufactured, um, that uh, degraded and specifically the impressionists got very disillusioned with chrome yellow and then they um, went back to Naples yellow. So Naples yellow sort of fell out of use with these new chrome yellows. And then you find this sp spike that in the 1870s that it comes back. So it's, it's not completely um, beyond the realms of possibility that um, even the Impressionist pictures, which we think of as bright and vibrant, were, were brighter and more vibrant at some stage. So, so that sort of brings that Naples yellow pigment back in. Lovely. Thanks very much. OK. Um, so uh, if anyone's got any further questions, uh, David will be around uh, during the drinks reception for, for anything else. Um, it just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much um, for giving such an interesting lecture, and um, I hope everyone else will join me in saying thank you again. There's uh, wine in the council room where you've got tea and coffee to start.